Coming to you from Studio A here at Proven Winners, Color Choice Shrubs, it's time for the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. Well, Stacy Neil Sadaka sang it well when he said, raking up is hard to do, now you know, now you know it's true. The leaves are pouring off the trees, and now what? Now what do we do? And that's what I'd like to talk about today because it's not a fig leaf of your imagination. Money grows on trees. They have nutrients and um, available, oh, let's say structure to improve your soil. I love this time of the year. Well, you know, it's people think of leaves as a chore. And undoubtedly, if you have a lot of trees, I have a neighbor, I think he said that he gets 35 leaf bags twice a season, mm. twice a year, trying to rake up all of the leaves. And uh, so it can be a lot of work. But yeah, it is a gift from nature, because it is something that you, you can use for free right. to improve your soil. Exactly. 35 bags? Uh, twice. Oh, my raking back. <laughs> <laughs> well, he has had one big tree removed. It was it was in help, poor condition. So maybe he's down to like 25 twice a season now. I don't know. Here's what I love about the leaves. They're alive. Look at how colorful they are. That means to me, instinctively, I put them in my soil. Something good is going to happen. I mean, Stacy, if you take a branch during the growing season and you cut it, what happens? The leaves shrivel up, turn brown, and fall off. But in fall, they're not shriveling and, uh, you know, curling up, they're falling off the tree in just beautiful technicolor. Yeah. I'm going to put those in the ground. <laughs> well, that's what the tree wants you to do, right? Otherwise, the leaves wouldn't be falling all over the ground. When we use leaves in our gardens, we are imitating the natural cycle exactly. of soil improvement. And, exactly. and so there is, of course, again, when it comes to your lawn, you can't just leave all the leaves and leave a thick layer if you want your lawn to survive. That won't work. But when it comes to garden beds or areas around trees, immediately under trees, by all means, leave the leaves, shred the leaves. Yes, we brought along some shredded leaves. And I was very impressed with your leaf shredding device. Oh, boy, I tell you what, is that fun? I call it the churninator. <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> it's amazing to play with. Oh, I, and I got to tell you a quick story about that. Uh, I have been, people have laughed at me before because when I was younger and crazy and I couldn't afford a leaf shredder like that, I would put on a pair of goggles, earplugs. I would grab the whippersnipper, the weed whacker, throw the leaves in a garbage can and just have <laughs> at it. And Make the it a witch's brew. <laughs> yes. And the neighbors would watch and laugh. That's how I used to do it. Okay. Well, that is creative. Was well, it effective? It was effective. And if you want to see the churninator, just uh, tune us in on YouTube. Look for Gardening Simplified Show and, and you can check it out. Yes. Footage shot by Rick himself of the churninator in action. Well, I have a lot of memories on this issue. I mean, I could talk about mulching leaves and leaves for hours. It's fun. When I was a kid in the 60s, people burned their leaves. Yep. They'd rake them to the curb. We'd be out there riding our bikes in the neighborhood and in the afternoon and and i mean the haze in the neighbor i think it was equivalent to smoking a couple of packs of cigarettes every time we went out there yeah it was a scent of fall the the yeah. smell of burning leaves was very much a part of the fall experience but i am grateful that things have eased up a bit in terms of the way people think about leaves yes, yes. You, you do need to lighten up the load on your on your lawn um, but you know, people are starting to leave the leaves and, and in, in addition to building up the soil, it provides shelter for all sorts of wildlife, forage for birds, right? and it's less work. It's less and, work. And in fall, if you have a lot of trees, who isn't looking for a little bit less work? Well, the, uh, leaves at their end of the life, at the end of their lives, as they float to earth, they have nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash content. Uh, carbon, uh, but it's also the organic content, uh, matter content in the soil. That's one of the benefits of building a great soil. So I just, I can't encourage people enough. I mean, I go out there scoping out houses who have maple trees and I drive around and then under the cover of darkness at night, I grab these beautiful leaf bags and uh, take them to my garden um, 
on a previous radio show I did, I made the mistake of saying that I was looking for maple leaves and needed some. You would think it was a Jerry Lewis Labor Day telethon. The leaves kept coming, but I love them. I'm just going to suggest that you do your leaf uh, peeping or borrowing in the day. It's a lot less sinister looking that way. Oh, but it's more fun at <laughs> night. Okay. All right. I don't want to take away your fun. So, Well, let me give you a limerick on this issue, okay? Beware those compostable thieves that steal your maple leaves. To his car under darkness, he drags your carefully packed leaf bags in Planta Claus, he believes. Now, that's a name that I got um, years ago. People would start calling me Planta Claus because there I am in the streetlights at night running with these big bags of leaves to my vehicle that I'm going to mulch uh, and put in my garden. So what stemmed from that, no pun intended, was a, uh, a Christmas song. Here comes Planta Claus, here comes Planta Claus, right down Planta Claus Lane, He's got a bag that's filled with leaves from the public domain. Here is trailer, jingle jangle, oh what a beautiful sight. So jump in bed and cover your head because Planta Claus comes tonight. See, I think I've just, I've cracked it here. The reason that you don't go during the day is you don't want a confrontation where they're going to say, hey, if you're going to take the leaves, at least you could rake them. Yes. <laughs> You're just trying to uh, avoid yes. that entirely. And just the leaf fairies come, the leaves go away, but they aren't helping you with the raking. And when it's dark outside and I'm grabbing those maple leaves, it's more difficult to shoot pictures and post them in social media, too. So. Isn't that Rick Weiss? <laughs> one, mo one more. Here comes Planta Claus. Here comes Planta Claus. Right down Planta Claus Lane. Fixing to take them. You can watch through the window pane. When leaves are falling, he comes calling. All is merry and bright. Put bags by the road and say your prayers because Planta Claus comes tonight. So there you go. I had to get that off. All right. Says. All right. Fair enough. Now, when we shred the leaves like this, Stacy, and I work them into the soil, it helps speed the decomposition process. And I find the following year, I have a lot of worms in the soil. Uh, yeah, because it, it adds organic matter and also oxygen, you know, by, by improving that structure. We talk a lot about composting and composting is great. You should absolutely compost and leaves are an important part of composting. But in addition, if you're grinding up your leaves and putting them in, it's, it's like you're composting right there. Yep. Uh, it's, it's happening exactly. in the bed rather than in your compost pile. Exactly. So I love it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Now, of course, we can mulch leaves into turf grass also. We don't want to smother the turf grass, but if you've got a good blade on that mower, they're finely chopped. A lot of people, like you said, Stacy, are leaving the leaves, mm -hmm. which would make a great marketing campaign. They, and, they are doing that. I think through like the Audubon Society okay. or National Wildlife Federation, I think something like that. Yeah. Okay. So they're, right. they're on to you with that one, but, but we, we support it. Whoever says it. But. I'm sorry, I just get enthusiastic about this because, like you said at the beginning, it's free, it's cheap, it's so beneficial. Why not take advantage of it? I agree. People go to great lengths to improve their soil when they don't realize it's all right there in their lawn waiting for them. Ready for you. Free for the taking. All right. Bon foliage, my friends. We're going to move on to plants on trial today. Looking forward to this. As a matter of fact, Stacy's going to talk about a plant that I love. I love Ooh. them all. I, we say that every, every episode, I think. Plants on trial coming up next here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. Uh, you know, it is leaf season, mm -hmm. and I always try to, we only have 320 some varieties of Proven Winners Color Choice shrubs to pick from. How do you choose? So I try to narrow it down. Some, you know, uh, episodes are more challenging than others. This being a leaf themed episode was pretty challenging because indeed all of our shrubs do have leaves. So <laughs> Thank that, goodness. that makes a very, very big, um, you know, pack to pick from. But the shrub for, that I chose for today's plant on trial is tiny wine nine bark. Yay. Yeah. Very nice little nine bark. And what's little about it. So it's about three to five feet tall and wide compared to six to eight feet tall and wide, which is conventional for, for the larger right. uh, nine barks that are out there. So it is slightly smaller in size. You know, whenever we talk about a dwarf plant or a tiny plant, it's always relative to how big that plant 
actually gets. Sure. You know, it doesn't mean that it's going to stay five inches tall. It just means for a nine bark, it's pretty tiny because it's, it's about half the size. It's quite tiny. Tiny wine nine bark. Stacy, lay that uh, botanical name on me because I oh. think it's a cool botanical It is name. a good botanical name. It is Physocarpus opulifolius. Oh, it sounds so good when you say it too. That's fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. So the way that that breaks down uh, is Physocarpus means bladder fruit. Really? So, yep. So the, the fruit, the, the seed head is kind of like... I mean, I would hesitate to call it like a puff, like a lot of plants that have like bladder and like bladder campion, you know, they have a big round kind of, you know, thing there that's got air in it. This right. one is not quite like that. I think it's a little bit more of a stretch. And the opulifolius comes from the plant's resemblance to viburnum opulus. Makes sense. So viburnum opulus is a very popular plant in Europe. It's also known as gilder rose. And so just because that kind of was the better established plant, physocarpus is the one that looks like viburnum opulifolius, like viburnum opulus, <laughs> rather than viburnum opulus looking like physocarpus. Also because, of course, viburnum is native to Europe and physocarpus is native to North America. It's one of our wonderful native shrubs. And so generally speaking, when we're talking about botanical nomenclature, the European stuff tends to get preference because Linnaeus was, of course, European. You're amazing, Stacy. All of that coming right off the top of your head. <laughs> Well, you know, I'm nothing if not pedantic, especially when it comes to <laughs> to botanical nomenclature. But let's get back to tiny wine okay. and the leaf show, because the other thing that's tiny about tiny wine, nine bark, is its leaves. Its leaves are much smaller than the typical nine bark. And uh, that kind of accomplishes two different things. It gives it a very, very textured look. Okay. You know, if you look at tiny wine in the garden center, or if you look at our uh, photos at gardening simplified on air.com. It has a much different look than you're used to seeing with a, uh, with a viburnum and vib or, sorry, now, I'll, now I've got viburnum in the head yeah, here, I much different than a physocarpus, your average nine barker physocarpus, um, which is going to have larger foliage and, and physocarpus are foliage plants. Yes, they flower and they have quite nice flowers, but they're generally thought of as foliage plants. So it has a much more textural distinctive look than your average physocarpus and those tiny leaves mean that it's never going to be extra work for you in the garden mm. because those little leaves fall and you don't really have to do anything. They right. just kind of, you know, drop and mulch the plant or blow away and pre shredded. Right. This is one of those, like, you know, especially if you are like my neighbor with his 35 bags of leaves twice a year, um, this could be a very good choice if you don't like raking leaves. So let's talk a bit about what it looks like. It is one of those purpley black type nine barks that became so popular about 20 well, how long ago did diablo come up uh come out oh boy it's been some time right so you, a lot of people are 10, familiar 20 years I, at least i'd say oh, well over 10 yeah. yeah uh so a lot of people are familiar with this variety of nine bark called diablo and that came from uh, the Netherlands. And it was the first dark leafed nine bark to hit the market. So we have nine barks growing abundantly through most of the Eastern US. In fact, if you were to take a hike almost anywhere in a number of different environments, you're probably gonna run into some of our native physocarpus. Okay. Now they are gonna be green. You're not gonna go, oh wow, that's so beautiful. I have that at home. It's gonna look green and a little bit more plain, especially if it's deeper in the woods. So as is often the case, Europeans look at our native plants and say, hey, this has actually got some pretty good stuff going for it. It's sturdy, it's nice, it has nice flowers. Let's see if we can tinker with it and get some nice color going. And that was how they uh, introduced the variety known as Diablo nine bark again about 20 some years ago. And that, so that was the first real dark leaf nine bark to kind of take the botanical world or the horticultural world by storm. Interesting. Now, that a is. lot of people are familiar with that plant. It was instantly popular because there's really nothing else like it. Very easy to grow. But a lot of people don't realize that it is not properly named. Its name is not Diablo, like the Spanish word for devil. Its name is actually Diabolo, which apparently is, I believe, the Dutch word for top, like a spinning top. Oh, 
fascinating. And I've been saying Diablo for 20 years. Yeah. And so this is just, you know, we're in America. We're obviously more familiar with Spanish. So we kind of just, our brains fill in and say, oh, it says Diablo. And so now if you were to go in and say, you know, I, I'm looking for Diabolo Ninebark, they'd be like, oh, you mean Diablo? And you just <laughs> have to be like, whatever you say. Yes, that's that's what I mean. I got a education on that one. <laughs> so whatever you plant, you plant, the Physocarpus has come a long way since Diablo. Uh, now, Diablo was a very unique and interesting plant, but as is often the case with dark leaf nine barks, very susceptible to powdery mildew. Okay. So that did kind of turn off a bunch of people, but here uh, at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs, our breeding goals with nine bark are reduction in powdery mildew. We're looking for resistant varieties that don't get powdery mildew. Now, if you have the green nine bark, no worries about powdery mildew whatsoever. It seems once we start uh, getting in those colorful genes, that's what you know kind of makes it much more susceptible to powdery mildew than the the strictly native species. But again, tiny wine has been tested. Plant it in full sun with good air circulation. You should not have any issues with powdery mildew developing on tiny wine specifically, despite the fact that it has that nice, again, dark purpley red uh, foliage. Stacy's talking about tiny wine, nine bark. You'll be able to find the information at our website, gardening simplified on air.com. And Stacy, there are people who are at their computers using the search engine of their choice and typing in F I, but oh. that's not, no, nope, it's, it's not that good. Well, type in nine bark. That'd be a little bit easier than yeah, trying to easy. sound out Physocarpus. But yes, Physocarpus is P-H-Y-S-O-C-A-R-P-U-S. And do you know where the, the name nine bark comes from? No. Okay, so apparently uh, it is because of the peeling bark, which has supposedly nine layers. Now, I have never counted if there are nine layers. Interestingly, um, hydrangea arborescens, our native smooth hydrangea, mm -hmm. sometimes goes by the common name wild seven bark. Okay. It is also peeling. Now, I have seen mature smooth hydrangeas. I have seen mature physocarpus. I the number of layers to my recollection are not distinguishable. So I, I don't know, if, you know, as with many common names, it's a good story, but not necessarily rooted deeply in truth. That's interesting. It really is though. Yeah. Somebody took the time to count the layers. I, or just estimated. Oh, estimated. Uh, ten, 10 bark just didn't sound as good. So they went with nine bark. <laughs> I do that to people, you know, like if we're looking at a tree, I say there's 75,231 leaves on that tree. And if you don't believe me, you count them. <laughs> Get an answer somehow, yeah. how, somehow or another. Uh, so whatever you call it, nine bark, it, it, the, the peeling bark, I think really does give it an extra layer yeah, of interest. This is, a, again, we talked about the leaves falling. It's a deciduous shrub. So those leaves are going to drop in autumn. But when they do, as your plant gets more and more mature, those the bark and those main stems really start to peel quite dramatically. And I think it can be very, very nice. It's a good plant to plant where it can be backlit. So you can kind of get that, you know, more That's of that effect. Idea. Uh to really, especially in winter. It's a great idea. Or, you know, if you have like some sort of like a, a, you know, spruce tree or something you can plant to, to kind of set that off. So it's just a nice little extra feature. The flowers, it has really pretty flower clusters in spring. It's in the rose family, which is another reason why so many nine parks are susceptible to powdery mildew because okay. of course the whole sure. darn family there is yeah. like a powdery mildew jamboree for the most part. Jamboree. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great native shrub. Um, and particularly if you're choosing a variety like tiny wine, easy to clean up after, great color, very easy care. Just make sure you're planting it in full sun to reduce that powdery mildew. Good air circulation, so follow those spacing recommendations. And I think you'll find it, uh, it makes itself right at home in just about any kind of landscape. Love it. I'm sold. All right. If you want to see pictures or a lot more information about Tiny Wine Nine Bark, just visit our website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Click on the show notes. We'll have everything that you need right there. Now, we're going to take a little bit of a break. When we come back, we're opening up that gardening mailbag, so please stay tuned. 
Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's one of my favorite times of the entire hour we are with you, where we answer your gardening questions. It's one of the ways that we try to simplify gardening for you. So if you have gardening questions, don't hesitate to reach out. You can reach us at help, H-E-L-P, at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, or just go to gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Right there, we've got a contact form. You can attach a picture. And in fact, even if you leave a comment on our YouTube video, Adriana will say, hey, I got a great question and sometimes we'll include those as well so many different ways to ask your question and so what do we got in the mailbag this week by the way i got a nice message this past week from uh, some ladies who listened to the gardening simplified show while walking through the park in tokyo japan oh how lovely yeah so that's wonderful that's very nice Keep you never the, know. Uh, yeah, you never know. Keep those messages, questions, comments coming. We appreciate it. Mary writes, I planted tulips in a container and flower box last fall. I planted some in the garage, no light, and the rest in outside pots with wire on top to keep critters out. They were nestled together on my patio in a corner, but otherwise not protected. I only got a few blooms in all the places where they were planted. Pots were plastic, flower by, box was freestanding metal. What's the best way to ensure success next spring? So interesting question. Now, I think I had talked about when I you know, realized that I had a, hor a horrible deer problem and I had purchased tulips and thought that I was going to be able to grow them and realized I was wrong. And so I tried to just force them and I put them in plastic pots, you know, my back patio there to, to get the cold treatment because this is what you can force them, you know, put them in these containers, let them sit through winter, get all the cold that they need and then bring them indoors, say sometime in starting in like mid-February and blammo flowers early, wow. uh, which no one's going to complain about in February. Um, but yeah, in my case, the squirrels had dug them up, but it sounds like Mary has had taken precautions on that. Now I do want to uh, quickly though, go to the one in the garage because my suspicion there is that that did not get enough cold treatment. Mm. What do you think? Interesting. Well, through the years, I've forced a lot of bulbs and nine times out of 10, when people have problems, the containers are above ground and got too cold and the soil froze. In other oh. words, when we talk cold treatment, we w were thinking 40 degrees, 35 to 40, not rock solid ice frozen. Mm. And if that happens, because the concept behind the dormant period is for the roots to be able to develop so that when the warmth of spring comes and it shoots up the stem, it has some gravitas at the base to be able to sustain that plant. Right. Or the spring comes or you bring it inside, which is like tricking it into an early exactly. spring. So however you're, you're doing this. Right. But the cold is important, yeah, for it to, to grow those roots. So perhaps it wasn't the cold, but it could have definitely been dryness in the garage. Mm. And I know I've definitely made a big deal over the past several weeks about how important it is, especially for tulips, to be very dry in their dormant period in, in summer in order for them to not rot. But they do need some water in the winter. So it's possible that the plants were just sure. too dry. Another thing I think a lot of people don't realize is if you are trying to pre-chill bulbs yourself by putting them in a refrigerator or you stored them in a refrigerator trying to prolong their life, if that refrigerator has apples or certain other fruits in it, it will actually cause the bud to die in within the flower within the flower bulb. So I don't know if that was an issue. Um, ethylene gas. Eth yeah. The ethylene gas, yeah, yeah it, it causes mm -hmm. that to to die. So um, it could be that the bulbs weren't deep enough. I feel like there's a lot of possibilities. It's kind of hard. I don't think that the container itself, the material of the container, because no. I know Mary mentions metal versus plastic. No. I don't think that would be an no. issue. No, as long as the container has drainage holes. Drainage I've been important. in many greenhouses that have huge coolers full of Valentine's flowers, Easter flowers. They're forcing these bulbs. That temperature is right around 35 to 40 degrees and higher humidity typically. and higher humidity yeah, yeah so i so i would say try make sure you water them after you pot them up and uh hey did you know this about tulip bulbs if you are forcing them and you plant the flat side facing out that's the leaf side and it will make a nicer little display there. you're right the largest leaf and we are in bulb discount time so please, by all means, go out, get those discount tulip bulbs, even if you can't grow them because you have deer like us. Put them, pot them up, water them when you pot them up, water them occasionally through the winter, bring them inside starting in February. Maybe she also brought them indoors too quickly and they didn't have enough cold. Could be. And Stacy, you're correct. The bulbs this time of year are 50% off, just like me. <laughs> 
Scott writes to us, send photo, he's sending photos of a mystery fungus in his mulch and asks, what's going on here? We have lived here 27 years, never seen anything. So, you know, I, when, I, we, when we talk about questions that we can answer on radio, I often shy away from those that have photos because it's kind of hard. Of course, you're listening, you don't know. You can go to YouTube and see the mystery fungus yourself. But I thought that Scott's question was really good, and I thought that it, uh, I wanted to take the time to answer it. And we will have those photos for you in YouTube or on the show notes at GardeningSimplifiedOnAir.com. Because I wanted to talk about this because there's so many people who have a similar experience to Scott. Where, you know, hey, I've lived here for so long. uh, And then all of a sudden this wacky fungus is growing in my yard. Am I cursed? What's going on? And the answer is simply, it's your mulch. So you can see in Scott's photo that he has some uh, relatively fresh looking red dyed mulch in there. And mulch, as we've talked about many times on the show, so great for plants. It really helps to create an ideal rooting environment where the roots are going to be able to grow vigorously for longer into winter, earlier when spring comes. So we love mulch. And to me, and probably to Adriana too, because she's a a big fan of mushrooms, um, mulch has an added benefit, and that's that it can grow all sorts of crazy stuff. You bet. bet. It's it's amazing to see. We, uh, throughout the years, I've seen this often, we... And, and I'm not trying to be gross here, but we do call it dog vomit yeah. fungus yep. is what we call Very it. Popular Looks like a dog had eaten a bottle of French's mustard and right there on the mulch. And it moves too. Yeah, and it's whenever, a slime mold. Yeah. So it's it's incredible to see. And you're right. What it needs to do, you know, it's a fun guy who just kind of hangs out until the conditions are right. And then if there's bacteria or decaying matter... Then it's a party. Right. So it's it's really, even the fungus comes from spores and not seeds, it's very much like a seed germinating. The conditions were just right for this to take place. So the spores were there, the moisture level, the humidity level, your mulch was at the right stage of decomposition because some funguses are going to need, you know, less decomposed mulch. Some will need more decomposed. So it's this ongoing, like, flux of possibility Mm -hmm. and so um scott's very cool mystery fungus is a coral fungus uh adriana helped me identify it like i said she is a burgeoning mycophile herself nice um and they're beautiful i mean i i thought that the the photos of the coral fungus were really quite beautiful so nothing to be alarmed about if you don't like them by all means go out there and kick them down or dig them out you can don't you don't have to worry about it there's nothing you can do really to not let them grow. They're going to do what they do. Um, but personally, my advice is enjoy the show. Yeah, I agree. I invite neighbors over. We set up lawn chairs. <laughs> you stir it a little bit. It reshapes. Oh, it's the amazing. dog vomit. Yeah, that is. Oh, I love fun guys. And, and like I said, fun guys just kind of hang out until conditions are right. Then party, party. Uh, on the mulch, you can stir the mulch. That helps a mm. little bit too. Yeah, by giving it more oxygen. Yeah. But again, people, I think they freak out because they think it's harmful. And yeah. it's not harmful. Not it's just harmful. a natural decomposition process. And I don't know, if I had it growing in my yard, I'd consider myself blessed. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well said. All right, Jan writes to us, I live in Hardiness Zone 5B, Central New York State. I have a potted rain lily. The directions for growing indicate that the pot should be moved indoors to a dark, cool area and allowed to go dormant. Do I water the plant over the winter during this period of time? Googling allowing plants to go dormant has resulted in mixed opinions. Please clarify. So it's such a good question, and I can certainly understand Jan's confusion. Uh, And we might be guilty of this ourselves because we've talked about people overwintering plants in containers, bringing them indoors, and talked about it being important to have some moisture. But uh, the answer with this and with so many things in horticulture, of course, is that it depends. And when it comes to bulbs, and particularly bulbs from the southern hemisphere, uh, like uh, rain lily zephyranthes, um, they need to be very, very dry over winter. So this is not one that you would be watering. So once it starts to go dormant, you're going to just kind of taper off your watering. It will start to absorb those leaves naturally, take in that energy. And then while it does not have those leaves, you're going to basically want to water it, not at all. Maybe a little bit halfway through its dormancy period just to make sure it doesn't dry out completely. But it helps, I think, to look at the areas where these bulbs are native to. 
and then research what their winters are like, how much rainfall is actually happening. And I don't know offhand where Zephyranthes is, is native to, but Chile or whatever. And that will give you a sense of how you can taper, you know, your uh, behavior with the plant to its actual needs. So very little to no water through the winter. When spring comes up and you take it out, you can give it some water that will help it spring back into growth. And then you just repeat. Yeah, you nailed it, Stacey, right on. Uh, you know, in nature, you think about its natural habitat, it's in drought, it's dry. Then we get some heavy rainstorms. How is it you put it? Blammo. Blammo. There it is. <laughs> That's why they're called rain lilies. So uh, anyway, uh, don't love it too much. Back off and it will reward you with its love in turn. We're going to take a little bit of a break. When we come back, Rick has got branching news stories. So please stay tuned. All right, folks, it's time for branching news, not breaking news, but we're not making this stuff up. Today in branching news, Stacy, let's start with this. You haven't given it much thought probably, but choosing the right leaf bags makes your fall chores easier, especially if you've got a lot of leaves or rugged materials to uh, to clean up. And when I was out there being Planta Claus, carrying those bags around uh, and set them out, I noticed all these big chain stores had their logos bright and big on... What a great marketing ploy. Oh, you put sure. them by the curb, everybody sees them. Right? Yeah, yeah. They know where you got your leaf bags. It's amazing. Well, if you want information, Popular Mechanics of all websites uh, did uh, some research on leaf bags. So we're going to post that at our website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, and you can do your own research. Do you have a preference? I'm just, you know, in case any listeners want to leave you some bags. Paper bags. <laughs> any paper bag. You're not picky about paper the bag bags. yourself. I reuse them. Oh, okay. well, so if you have a favorite, you know. <laughs> Let them know so they can be sure to, it's like leaving cookies and milk out for Planta That's Claus. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Oh, I like that. <laughs> My mind is just racing right now. Okay, leaf words of the day. Mammock, not hammock that you uh, take a nap in, but mammock is a verb. It means to break and tear, cut into fragments like we do with our leaves. Oh, I've never heard that before. Mammock. M so are you changing the name of your... I might. <laughs> Mammoconator. I told you. <laughs> I'll be back. Yeah, so uh, you got my mind racing here. Sorry. <laughs> holus bolus. Holus bolus. That's an adverb. I love that. Uh, it means all at once. Oh. Holus bolus. Just the leaves fell off the tree. Holus bolus. So there you go. All right. Beloit, Wisconsin. People go to Noodles and Company to save a buck, not to have one interrupt their meal. But that's what happened in Beloit, Wisconsin last week when a deer came crashing through the restaurant's window. They have surveillance uh, video, et cetera, et cetera. Fun to watch. We're going to put that link at the website. Um, and then after the deer um, left, no one was harmed and the deer was able to leave just fine. Uh, the location has reopened. They did a deep clean, and they're now offering a two-buck mac and cheese special. I like that. Macaroni and cheese is like a, a warm hug for your taste buds, you know? Yeah. Do you think the deer like it? Evidently not. <laughs> he hit the road. But the buck stops there. Hey, dark-eyed juncos. Ooh, love them. Okay, I figured you would. That's why I threw this into the mix. A small sparrow that's synonymous with winter's return across much of the United States. So in other words, when you start seeing these dark-eyed juncos, uh, usually underneath your feeder, because mm -hmm. they like to pick up the seed underneath the feeder, they've, they've moved further south from where they love to be, way north. And, uh, and so you've got these ground feeders that are hopping around in the snow uh, under your feeder. So... Just thought I'd bring that up, that if you're seeing them, that means winter has arrived. Yes, I definitely see the return of the juncos as kind of like the end of the season. Yeah. So, you know, for better or for worse, I think I might have had hummingbirds and juncos overlapping for maybe a week or so. Okay. So, so as the summer goes and winter comes, the... <laughs> They, they do overlap a little bit. So a harbinger of winter, be looking for them, dark-eyed juncos. Six people used a large potted plant to break into a drive through window at a South Carolina pharmacy last week. Unbelievable. <laughs> wow. 
<laughs> surveillance footage shows six people in masks and gloves using a large potted plant to break out the pharmacy's drive through window. I beg your garden. That's a terrible use of a plant. I, I mean, if you're going to break into something, I think you could find a better tool. <laughs> My, I, guess I they, can't believe this. Uh, you don't have... You don't have puns prepared for this? Uh, <laughs> no. Well, I'll tell you what. The, uh, this, is, this is just so shocking. Uh, these, uh, these people who use these, the potting soil and the plant uh, are partners in grime. Let's call them that, in, uh, in breaking this window. It's just awful. I don't know. I just thought do I'd you, bring it up. Do you think when their trial comes and they're selecting the jury members, they're going to have to be like, you know, are you a gardener? He's out. <laughs> <laughs> Plant lover, do you post pictures of house plants on Instagram? Yeah, it yeah. would disqualify you from serving on the jury if you actually cared about plants. Probably that's a good point. <laughs> this I'd is like how to my be brain on works that so. jury because I have a real problem with this too. First of all, breaking into a pharmacy—what a dumb thing to do! But to use a potted plant, right? Yeah, I guess they just really didn't like the plant. Well, let's move on to something else. Let's move north to New York City. They've uh, found an effective way to kill rats. The strategy involves pumping carbon monoxide directly into rat burrows. Now, of course, anyone who's spent time in New York City, I know you've been there a, I, uh, yes. a long time, uh, Stacy. And uh, for myself, too, I've visited many times. And when you go down in the subway and you're waiting for the, the train to come and you look down there in the tracks, it's, it's quite unnerving, actually. So they have a real rat problem, but they... They have found that this is so effective that it will wipe out the rats in areas where they use it uh, almost 100%. Uh, they just get into these burrows and pump in carbon monoxide, and it's done. So, you know, I have a, a lot of, if you are squeamish about rats, I have a lot of rat horror stories. I'll bet you do. You know, because I was the horticulturist at Tavern on the Green. And at the time we had these big elaborate, you know, flower change outs that we were putting new plants and everything had to look tip top all the time. So we would always have this stock of, you know, eight inch potted material in the back there. And I'll tell you, you start spacing a bunch of eight inch daffodils or moms or impatience close together. You've got a, a little rat heaven yes so i would go to pick them up and the rats would run across my feet oh man <laughs> you don't forget that feeling i can tell you that oh they have an enormous mouse problem in new york city with these things yes so uh yeah you asked about puns with rats it's easy this is ratical they have no regrets that one's a stretch <laughs> they eradicated the problem this is going to be a frequent ritual. I'll stop now. Uh, you know, rats aren't great. And, of course, they can transmit a lot of disease. But I think they're, you know, largely misunderstood. I, I didn't hate them as much as some New Yorkers. <laughs> oh, my. Well, a, uh, a very agile chihuahua has left the Internet in stitches after a video of the dog climbing a tall garden fence without any issues went uh, viral. So we're going to put the link there at the website. I watched it too. Just this adorable dog. They call him Spider Dog. And uh, he climbs this tall garden fence because he wants to be on the other side. And uh, it was posted in social media and people just went nuts over it. Over it it, just was, it, it. was pretty cute. It's cute. I, I watched it. Yeah, it was a chain link fence. So it's not like he was scaling some sort of, you know, stockade fence or something like that. He didn't yeah. jump it. He just, but he took his little paws and climbed right up that chain link fence. And uh, finally, in uh, branching news, firefighters have tackled a blaze at a farm growing Christmas trees in Dundee. Uh, this is in Scotland. The Scottish Fire and Rescue Service said six fire engines were dispatched to the Tayside Forestry after a blaze broke out on Saturday, October 28. Wow, is that sad? Or I shouldn't end on a sad story like that. No, that is sad. I don't, I'm not even going to give it a pun. A Christmas tree farm burns down? Well, you know, it's unfortunate, but the the conifers, they have a lot of volatile oils. Right. So they are, like I know in areas out west here in the U.S., where firescaping is really important, they often recommend not using conifers because of those oils. If it gets very, very dry, they sure. can kind of, you know, flash. So, uh you know, oh. mulch, this is, this is one of the reasons why lawns became popular is they kind of serve as a fire break. 
I'm depressed now. I'm sorry. I, I'm like the you Grinch bringing up stories. You want me to tell you more rat story. stories? Well, let me, <laughs> let me finish on this. <laughs> Sometime we're going to do a show just on rats. Yes, let's do that. The uh, Royal Horticultural Society, which runs the Chelsea Flower Show, hopes to make gardening and nature more accessible to young people, inspire the next generation of growers. And uh, so the, in the coming year, they have a no adults allowed garden, and it's being designed by a group of primary pupils from the Sullivan Primary School in Fulham, London, who have been working on it since uh this past summer's so how cute there's is that? a positive to end with. I, I, well I, I i feel a little left out but sure it's good for the kids <laughs> well this show has been good for me and i hope it's been good for you and it's a kick in the plants to do this show with you stacy thank you likewise rick enjoy your week and a big thank you very much to adriana robinson for everything she does as engineer and producer of our show thank you adriana most of all thanks to you keep tuning in share it with friends and neighbors watch on youtube look for us on instagram visit our website gardening simplified on air.com look for our podcast wherever you get your favorite podcasts have, have a, a great, great week. week see you